Okay, so uh, before we get started, before we get to Vegas comments, um, actually I wanted to say a few things about David Bowie. And uh, if that doesn't interest you, that's fine. You can click here. We'll put a thing, we'll put a link in the, in the bottom too. Um, so you can go right to Las Vegas comments. But I think that the outpouring of grief and celebration and sadness and everything else that's happened since David Bowie's death has been uh, really important. And I think worth talking about at least a little bit. And so I kind of just wanted to talk through that maybe just as much for me as possibly for you. Uh, so, uh, but before we do that, there's, I gotta do one thing. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think, you know, in my life, there have been maybe five songs uh, that had a huge impact on me. And there were things like, um, you Are Invited by the Dismemberment Plan, uh, Vaseline Machine Gun by Leo Kotke, uh, The Park in the Backyard by Robert Ashley, and um, Ziggy Stardust by David Bowie. And uh, a, like a really good song, a great song does this incredible thing where it, it answers a question that you didn't know should have ever been asked. It, it does this thing where it defends its own characteristics with this confidence where when you first hear it, you kind of, you simultaneously didn't know that such an arrangement of things was even possible, but also it's this perfect expression of exactly whatever that thing is. It's like, it's like opening up this door and seeing this perfectly furnished room that you had no previous conception of. And I think for a lot of people, myself included, David Bowie did that not just with his music, but also with his persona. Because, I mean, a bisexual alien rock superstar. Like, here's me being 13 and not yet knowing a lot about the world, though thinking I know it all, thinking like, wait, you can, you're allowed to just invent, and I mean, of course you are. Of course you are. And I think in all of his instances, and there were, you know, countless of them, uh, Bowie was uh, this type of person where you didn't know that this kind of person could exist, yet there he was being it perfectly, just constantly reinventing himself, uh, reinventing characters, and showing his audience, like, just over and over and over again throughout his life and throughout ours, how the world and people and art and fashion could be. You know, I think losing a, um, a creative hero is really hard because, you know, it feels silly uh, because you didn't know these people as people. You didn't hang out with them. I didn't know David Bowie. But he was a person who showed me uh, countless things about not only the world, but myself. Uh, and I think that that's, you know, that the group of people for whom that is true is sizable. And I mean, we can talk about how we spent all of this time with his work and his work was maybe deeply personal. And so it feels like we got to know David Bowie as a person and that's why we're sad because we spent all of this time with his, his creative output, his body of work. But really, I think that in more ways, um, his work helped us get closer to ourselves and not to him, doubly so. I think because there's there's almost a different David Bowie for every person, if not a different David Bowie for the same person at different points throughout their entire life. And I mean, that is a magical accomplishment to be able to do that. For this, we wanted to do um, an all Bowie version of the record wall just as kind of like a tribute. Uh, so I went online uh, to a bunch of stores. Um, ended up calling a bunch of places, and his entire discography is sold out everywhere. Um, you can't, I cannot buy David Bowie records if, if, if I had an infinite budget. They're just not available. That's, I think, right. That's, you know, how it should be. Uh, so, ground control to Major Tom. Uh, you really did make the grade. I think you did everything you could. So, thanks. All right, let's talk about Vegas. Uh, so first and foremost about the Vegas episode, I just wanna say thanks to everybody who has been encouraging um, about us trying something new, which is always scary, uh, and it's doubly so um, if we try it and then everybody hates it and is like, how dare you change anything ever? 
we hate change. Uh, so thank you a million times over uh, for all of your support and all of the all of the positive reactions and everything. It really it goes a long way. It means a lot. Edmund Rangel uh, compares Vegas to Venice, and actually, I think sort of uh, this comment acts as a as a, a nice way to organize thinking about the comments as we go through them, which is um, there's this. Uh, consistent question it seems about who Vegas is for and we touched on this really briefly in the episode that you know the strip in paradise is for people to come and relax and have fun and gamble and play but there are you can't deny the fact that there are people who live there and so that tension uh, is something that is maybe more central to the the weirdness and um, the uh, uniqueness that is Vegas than we gave it credit in the episode itself. So uh, yeah, this is something I think to just sort of keep in mind uh, as we're talking for the next couple minutes. Relatedly, PhD in 30 talks about how Las Vegas is a relatively young city in two different ways and that it is maybe experiencing some growing pains in realizing that its infrastructure needs to account more seriously for the people who are there who are not tourists. And, you know, this made me think, you know, if you think of the history of imperialism as um, stopping certain countries around the world from learning how to govern themselves and then learning how to uh, build their own infrastructure, learning how to um, uh, build and manage their own government governmental bodies, um, I wonder if you can think about Vegas as sort of... Um, uh, like a land that was colonized, that's sort of suffering from um, the history of economic imperialism, that that Vegas never learned to grow up because it didn't have to, uh, and that it had it had some other thing kind of taking care of it in some sense, and that was just this constant influx of cash over the last hundred years. Um, yeah, I don't know if that makes sense, but I was thinking about it on the drive to the studio today. All the letters also on the subreddit talks about how Vegas might actually be um, a really great uh, set of ruins, not just for the United States, but for the world because of the countless simulacra of buildings from around the globe that, you know, as a set of ruins, it is um, a, a, a castle um, and a pyramid and uh, the Statue of Liberty and all of these other um, big and important things. But also uh, they make the great point about the dam being, uh, the Hoover Dam being maybe an even greater and um, more confident uh, site of ruin uh, in the distant future. And I think that this is a really, really great point and something that we didn't really touch on at all is, you know, it, it was silly to have mentioned the dam and to have talked about the architecture of Las Vegas, but to not have connected the two as um, uh, structures related to uh, confidence and excess and and power literally uh, than we did so yeah this is a this is a great point and I'm just now thinking of alien civilizations millions of years from now coming down and being like hmm wonder what this thing was Patrick Frost had one of a couple comparisons between Las Vegas and China which is a thing that never even dawned on me that a connection that I never would have made and I would be really curious to hear what everybody else thinks about this but it, it's kind of this idea that there have been many dynasties um, many cultures over uh, over an amount of time that have sort of come in and changed or developed rather uh, and changed the uh, the landscape and sort of invented invested it with this really complex meaning. And I think this is really interesting. It's It feels weird to me to compare the long and complicated um, and really rich history of China to something like Vegas. Um, but I can, I can kind of see where this connection gets made. And there must be something there because it came up several times in the comments. So yeah, what did you guys think about this? Thunk uh, provides a engineer's perspective on ruins, which is fascinating. And that there's this idea that if a, if ruins are standing, if a, if a structure is standing for millennia after it has been built, then it is in some sense overbuilt. Uh, and that it should, these structures should last for exactly as long as they are intended to be used. And so now we can ask this question, I think, about um, casinos uh, along the Strip as whether or not they are 
they are disposable buildings in some way, which, uh, you know, I think we sort of maybe tiptoed around that idea, but didn't actually, didn't actually confront it directly, which, yeah, I'm gonna think about this. This is a great comment. Links to this one and all the others uh, in the doobly-doo. Aaron Merriman, uh, who is a local to Las Vegas, corrects one of our, one of our central points, which is that, um, in that block where we said that there was not one original building still standing, that's not necessarily true. There are still some buildings that have just changed their facade, they've changed owners, they've had a little bit of an update or renovation, but it is still the same structure. Uh, and I think that this is a really important point and maybe even just makes it more interesting that, that the turnover uh, or the sort of demolition of um, certain uh, uh, casinos is in some ways more metaphysical than it is physical. And I think that that is just, I think it maybe makes the point even better, but I don't know, I gotta think through this. But yes, thank you, Aaron, for uh, pointing this out. Um, do we didn't know, I didn't know that, that didn't, didn't come through in the fact checking, which probably meant that we didn't do a good job fact checking. And finally, on the subject of Nevada. No one here on the East Coast says Nevada. Uh, um, I talked to some people. Um, we mostly thought Nevada was a joke. We didn't know that that was like a, like a thing, like a real thing. And uh, not only just a thing, but um, I, I found this great post on Quora, someone asking what the actual correct pronunciation of Nevada is. And uh, a linguist answered and said that, you know, there's defense throughout history for either way, but it is a shibboleth for uh, people who live in Nevada, that it is a, it is a way to indicate that you are um, part of the in-group. Um, when other people say Nevada, they are wrong. It's Nevada, which, I love it, I think. I just think it's interesting, because I, I had no idea. Um, not gonna lie though, probably still gonna say Nevada. But I am the per also the person who says Jaif, so. Uh, sorry? Not sorry.